Again. And if you guys have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 27. It says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. It says, hey, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. Everyone say citizens of heaven. Citizens. Conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. And then turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, but our citizenship, everyone say citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, hey, we're citizens of heaven. So what does that mean? What does that mean when the Bible says we're citizens of heaven? And if you guys are taking notes, the title of tonight's message is Far From Home. Everyone say Far From Home. Far from home. Anyone seen the new Spider-Man Far From Home? Yeah, it, it was good, right? Jay, did you like it? You loved it. It's so good, right? Isn't it crazy that like, he's not going to be in the MCU anymore? It's so sad. We'll talk later. But anyways, man, I'm so excited. I stole my title from Spider-Man. Tonight's going to be a good night. Everyone say far from home. Insecurities week three. All right, let's get started. Father God, we just thank you so much for everything you're going to do tonight. God, we pray that you just speak through me. Uh, you lead us, you guide us through your word and by your spirit. Father, I pray that tonight lives are changed. That's not my words, but you just speak through me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Has anyone ever been lost before? I get lost all the time. I get lost with my GPS. It's, it's horrible. I remember this time, uh, and this was a number of years ago, I was uh, in West Virginia, and I was visiting a friend out there, and basically what had happened was we're on our way to my friend's house, and we couldn't get the GPS to work, first of all. So we're following directions like they did back in the olden days, uh, like, you know, back in colonial days when they actually had to write down. So, so we're, like, following the directions, and uh, the bad thing was not only was our GPS not working, but a snowstorm started happening. And you got pictures, like we're on the, these West Virginia windy roads, and all of a sudden it starts snowing. And it starts snowing more and more and more. Wind's going. So we pull up to this, uh, this part in the road where the road forks, okay? And the direction said we were supposed to turn, didn't say which way, but we were supposed to turn on Buffalo Creek Road. Isn't that a great name for like a West Virginia street? So it says we're supposed to turn down Buffalo Creek Road. So we're like, okay, which way is that? So we see a sign, it's fairly obvious. It says Buffalo Creek Road with an arrow going this way. So we're like, okay, that's awesome. So we turn down there. What happened was during the snowstorm, the wind was so bad. I'm not making this, this up. It actually blew the sign. So it was facing the wrong way. So when the road forked, it was facing the wrong direction. So we go down this road thinking it's the right way, but in reality, it's sending us deep into the West Virginia wilderness in the middle of a snowstorm. So we're, we're going through like, we're driving this thing for like half an hour, 40 minutes, out in the middle of nowhere. Like snow is coming, wind's going. It's just, it's not a good thing at all. So we end up calling our friend and we're like, hey, I think we're going in the wrong direction. I mean, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, we haven't found your house yet. So he's like, yeah, he's like, you should have been there by now, turn around. So we go to turn around and we have to go back up this hill that we came down. We go to go up this hill, we get close to the top and all of a sudden the car stops moving. We hit a sheet of ice. All of a sudden my friend's van starts going backwards, backwards, backwards. Me and him start screaming. The van's going backwards. We're screaming. We're screaming. It's going backward. And all of a sudden, we veer off the road. The van goes off the road, goes down to this ditch. We're still screaming. Well, he's screaming. I'm trying to be the brave one. He's screaming. We go down. We veer off the road. The back of the van hits the side of the mountain. And all of a sudden, the back window shatters. Car stuck in a ditch. Now we're literally stranded in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia. We have no idea where we're at in the middle of a blizzard. Not good. So we call my friend back up and we're like, hey, um, yeah, we kind of wrecked the, wrecked the car now and we don't know where we are. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna find you guys. So he's literally driving down every single back road he can find. So, so we just wait in the van because thankfully the van still had heat even though it was wrecked, uh, it still had heat, but the back window was busted out so we had to keep the heat going or else it would get kind of chilly. So anyways, we're waiting in there and an hour goes by, two hours go by, three hours go by. And we had wrecked the van. It was close to like 11 o'clock at night. So by this time, it's like 2 a.m. And also, random fact, we couldn't get any music to play in the van other than one CD, which was Veggie Tales. 
So again, wind's going, snow is going, a van is wrecked on the side of the mountain, Larry Boy's singing. It was horrible. If you've never come close to death while you're listening to Where's My Hairbrush, man, you haven't lived. <laughs> so, so anyways, we're, uh, like, we're just like, this could not get any worse. No joke. All of a sudden, the van slowly shuts off. Well, what we realized was the tailpipe was actually wedged in the mountain and all the carbon monoxide was building up. Thankfully, the back window was busted out so we didn't die, but we could have died. And, and uh, it like built up to the point where the van just shut off. So we're like, okay, what do we do? We have no heat anymore. We're in the middle of like the wilderness. Our friend doesn't even know where we're at. It's a blizzard. What do we do? So my friend goes, hey, I was taking a pee break a couple minutes ago. I saw a house way in the distance. I think we can walk to it. Okay. So we, no joke, we start walking through blizzard, the woods. We go up to this random house in the middle of nowhere. So I'm knocking on the, the door. No one's coming. We don't even know if anyone's home. So I go, I'm like peeking through the window. Finally, at the last second, this 65-year-old West Virginia lady wearing nothing but a rainbow color bathrobe <laughs> comes to the door. And she's like, hello, remember it's 2 a.m., and we're like, hey, I'm so sorry, ma'am, um, but during the snowstorm, we happened to, and she just interrupts us, and she goes, uh, you wrecked your car, didn't you? You fell in the ditch. <laughs> we're like, does this happen often? She's like, every winter, someone was stuck in there last Tuesday. Why don't you guys come on in? I got food, I got extra cookies, <laughs> I got fig newtons and a, and a bunch of bananas. So she ends up calling my friend up, uh, tells him exactly where we are. Uh, he ends up coming, saving the day. I'll never forget, he walks in this like random West Virginia lady's house in the middle of nowhere, and he's like looking for us, and he finds, he literally turns the corner, and there I am sitting on her couch with a box of fig newtons and a banana, and he, like I literally was just like loving life in that moment, because you get hungry when you're almost like dying in the wilderness. But, but anyways, have you ever been lost? And you just, in that moment, because it's frustrating trying to, get found. It's, it's frustrating trying to find your way, get home. I, if you ever drove through, drove through the streets of Cleveland, I get lost every time. But do you ever get lost and you just say, you know what? I think I'm just going to stay here. It'd be less work. Like, what if I was like, okay, you know, it's going to be a lot of work getting out of this situation. I'm just going to sit back. I'm going to live in the West Virginia wilderness. This will be great. Like, wouldn't that be crazy? Or if I just like decided to make my home in this old lady's house just eating fig newtons the rest of my life. That'd be so weird. But so many times in life, like the Bible says that we're supposed to live as citizens of heaven. The heaven is our home. That we're just passing through on this earth. But we let the things of this earth bog us down, tie us down. We get so consumed with everything going on that we forget where we're going. We forget where our real home is. We let this relationship, that relationship, uh, thing after thing after thing just tie us down, tie our thoughts down to the, to the point where we're just so consumed with insecurity. We're so consumed with what people think. But in reality, if we realize heaven was our home and we're just passing through down here, man, it would change everything. It'd be crazy just for me to sit down and say, I'm staying here. It'd be too much work to go where I'm supposed to go. In the same way, it's crazy for us to say, hey, I'm going to be so consumed with the things of this earth and forget that heaven is my home and forget to live eternity-minded, knowing that this, what we do here in this earth, is actually the shortest thing we'll ever do. When you think about that, because the Bible says that we have all of forever promised to us. And how long do we live on this earth? You know, if it's a long time, maybe 100, 120 years, most, for most people, 70, 80, 90. In the scope of forever, what we do on this earth is the shortest thing we'll ever do. What we do on this earth is the shortest thing we'll do for all eternity. But we need to know heaven is our home. Hebrews 9, 27 says, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. The Bible says that each and every one of us, we're going to come to the point where we breathe our last on this earth and we step foot in it, into eternity. And the Bible says after that we face judgment. And you might be out there and you might be thinking, man, that just sounds, that's terrifying. But I want you to know the Bible says for us as believers, we can know we have eternal life. We can know that we have eternal life. If you're out there and you're saying, man, I don't know, oh, we're going to give an opportunity at the end to pray with you and, and make that commitment to follow Jesus. Because the Bible says if you 
over in Romans, it says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. It's that easy. A lot of people think it's by good works. You got to do enough good works to get to heaven. You got to do all this stuff right. But the Bible says, if you believe on Jesus and give him your life, make him your Lord, that's the only way to get to heaven. Because God loves you so much. God didn't, God didn't want us to have to live the perfect life. He wanted to make it so simple that if we believe on Jesus, all our sins are forgiven. If we can come to him knowing, hey, I have eternal life promised to me. And in case you guys have never heard that before and you're like, okay, that sounds kind of strange. Uh, do you know that God's perfect? God's perfect. How perfect do you have to be to get to a God that's perfect? How good do you have to be to get to a God that's perfect? You have to be perfect. And each and every one of us, of, each and every one of us have made mistakes. You've made mistakes, I've made mistakes. And you might be out there saying, I'm not that bad. We've all made mistakes. All of us are messed up. The Bible says if you've sinned once, man, you're guilty. And God knew that. God knew that none of us would be good enough to get to him. So what did he do? He sent his one and only son to die on the cross. He, he sent his one and only son to, to take our sin, our punishment. The Bible's very clear of what, when Jesus died on the cross, what that looked like. But I believe that we, don't, we haven't even scratched the surface to know what really happened to him. Because the Bible says not only was he beaten, not only was he bruised for our sin, but when he went on the cross, I mean, he took every sin, every, all the punishment that all of us should have received on him spiritually. So we know what he looked like in the natural, but we have no idea what he looked like in the spirit. And I believe, man, with every single sin on him, he died on the cross. He went to hell, went to the grave. He defeated hell in the grave, and then he rose from the dead. Why did Jesus go to hell? So you and I would never have to. He took a punishment that, that we, we should have had. So now if we believe on him, we get everything that he should have got. Man, Jesus lived the perfect life. He never sinned once. So if we believe on him, he gives us his righteousness, and he took our sin. The second we believe on him, he wipes everything away. I, I love that. It says over in uh, uh, John chapter 14, verse 2, it says, There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Jesus says, hey, I'm going, and I'm going to pre prepare a place for you. Do you know, like, the second you believe in Jesus, they start working on your place up in heaven. Isn't that amazing? And there's another translation that says that, that Jesus says, hey, I'm going to, going to pre prepare a mansion for you. I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. And you might be out there saying, like, mansion. Like, I don't need a mansion. Like, like I don't need all that. Well, the thing about heaven is like there's not a shortage of property. So like, of course you can have a man. Like you don't have to worry about having too much up there. But man, Jesus said, hey, I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if we know heaven is our home, we know that's ahead of us. So a couple quick points and we'll let you guys get out of here. So if we know that heaven is our home, that we're just passing through on this earth, that if we know this earth is just temporary, this earth is the shortest thing, Living on this earth is the shortest thing I'm ever going to do. If we know that, number one, we need to know that we're called to live as citizens of heaven. We're called to live as citizens of heaven. And we live in a culture that says things like, this was kind of popular a couple of years ago, but you know, like the whole like, YOLO, like you only live once. And people would do like the craziest stuff because all in the name of YOLO, like, I mean, I, I only live once, so I'm going to, I mean, I would hear stuff like that. And I'm like, there's no way I'm doing that because... I only live once, <laughs> you know, like why would you do like this stupid stuff if you only live, you know, but I would just hear people say it time and time again, but I want you to know the Bible says you live more than once, you live on this earth, but then if you believe on Jesus, you live again, and if you've lost loved ones, I want you to know if they've believed on Jesus, man, you're going to see them, them again, and they might have been in your past, but they're also going to be in your future, and, and whenever, whenever I lose someone close to me, I always try to remember that, that, hey, the stuff I did with them in the past, and maybe, maybe I wanted to do more things, and I didn't get time before they passed away, maybe a grandparent passed away, maybe an aunt or uncle, I want you to know that someday you're going to get to do that stuff with them up in heaven. Some of the stuff won't even matter then, but some of the stuff, man, you're going to get to do that with them, because they, they're not just in your past, but they're in your future. But I mean, heaven is our home. What does it mean to live as a citizen of heaven? Like, what does that mean? And I, I like to think of it like this. You know, us being American citizens, we have certain rights, certain privileges, that even if you were to go to another country and you step foot in the embassy, 
all of a sudden those rights and privileges would come back on you. So us as believers, we have certain rights and certain privileges. And the Bible's very clear what those look like. Uh, if you guys turn to Psalms uh, 103, starting in verse 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. First of all, it says, hey, don't forget these things. Anyone forget things? Like, I forget things all the time. I forget my keys. I forget uh, my phone. I, I literally have so many things in my phone so I don't forget meetings. Like, I'm always forgetting things. But the thing is, if you forget what God says about you, you can't put your faith in it. And if you can't put your faith in it, you're never going to receive it because God moves when we have faith. But the enemy will do this. He'll try to get you to forget what God said. You ever go to church on a Wednesday night or a Sunday or a Saturday and the next day someone's like, oh, what they teach about? And you're like, I have no idea. Why? Because you forgot about it. And that's fine. I've been there. We've all been there. But if you forget what God's promised you, you can't put your faith in it. So that's why it says, hey, hey, Forget not his promises. Don't forget these things. So it says, hey, forget not all his benefits. And it lists a couple. It says, who forgives all your iniquities. Basically, that means your sin. God forgives all your sin. Do you know the second you believe in Jesus, like we were saying a second ago, God wipes it all away. He erases all your sin. And then if you, if you mess up again, all you got to do is go to God and say, God, forgive me. And the Bible says he separates your sin as far as the east is from the west. He completely forgives it. He forgets it. They say the human brain... It's literally impossible for you to forget something. Once it's in there, it's impossible to forget it. And I know what you're thinking, like, like I forget things all the time. No, it's still in there. It's still cataloged somewhere in your brain. It's just you can't recall it, but it's in there. Well, the Bible says that God separates your sin from the east, as far as the east is from the west, and he chooses not to remember it anymore. That's amazing. And the second you go to God and ask him to forgive you, he forgives it. He forgets it. I'm not saying you can go to God and say, God, forgive me for sinning. I'm going to do the same thing next Friday, but forgive me. Like, no, he's not going to forgive that because the Bible says you have to repent. Repentance means you, you're going one direction, you turn, you go the other. You have to repent. But, man, if you, if you come to God and say, God, forgive me, and your heart's right, and maybe tomorrow you mess up and do that same thing again, do you know God forgave you still? Why? Because your heart was right. Your heart was repentive. Your heart wanted to turn. But if your heart's just like, ah, you know, we all make mistakes. I'm going to do this again tomorrow. That's not repentive. But if you say, God, forgive me. I'm so sorry. Help me overcome this. And then tomorrow you slip up. Man, God forgave you. And then you go to God again. You say, God, forgive me. I know I've done this for the 99th time. You know what he's saying? Mm -mm. To me, it's the first. Because God forgot about 98 other times he did it. The second you go to God, he wipes it away. He forgives it. He forgets it. That's incredible. It says, God forgives all your iniquities. Then it goes on to say, it says, who heals all your diseases. And this is a tough one. There are churches and churches and churches that preach against this, that say God doesn't heal. That's done away with. And I'm not saying anything against them. Like, a lot of those people, they have amazing hearts that they want to please God. But how in the world is the first part of the verse still accurate, that God forgives sin, and the second part of the verse isn't for today? Why is it the first part? Yeah, man, God will forgive your sin. Whoa! Oh, yeah. Um, it doesn't say it in there, but that second part, uh-uh, he's done. He's done with that. No, if it's in there, it's in there. So, so many times we start building our doctrine, and I'm not judging anyone's heart. I, people who have done this, I bet, have amazing hearts. But what happens is they're praying for someone, they're believing for a loved one, it doesn't happen. Maybe they end up going home early, passing away, and then all of a sudden, if you're not careful, you start building your doctrine, your beliefs on what you've experienced instead of what his word says. Man, that didn't work. They didn't get healed. God must not heal anymore. Instead of saying, hey, I don't know why that didn't work, but God's still a healer. I've seen people healed, man, of cancer. I've seen people healed of tumors. I've seen people heal the craziest stuff, and then I've seen people go home early. Why is that? Does it mean God, God heals some but not others? No. It doesn't mean that. Why didn't they get healed? I don't know. 
I love the book of Job. You, you hear all this crazy stuff that happens to Job, like literally insane stuff. Pretty much the whole book of Job, his friends come and they start like talking smack and, and they just start saying all the stuff. And then God shows up and God says pretty much everything they said was garbage. But then he says, hey, Job asks them like why this stuff happened. You know what God says? God doesn't give him an answer. And I think it's so important that when we don't have all the answers, we keep trusting God. Jesus said to a bunch of his disciples, he said, hey, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you know what people did? That's weird. And they walked away. We read that and we know, hey, he's talking about believing on him. He's, he's talking about him dying on the cross, that we need to accept this free gift of salvation. He's talking about communion. He's talking about all this. That makes sense to us. At the time, they didn't understand it. If they had hung on a little bit longer, it would have made a little bit more sense to them. But in that moment, they were like, I'm done with this Jesus thing. But if they had stayed connected, they would have understood but they gave up too soon. Man, let's never give up too soon. Because I believe for a lot of us, there's situations that we don't understand. And we're like, well, why did this happen if God still heals? Why, why did this? We're going to get to heaven and he's going to show us and we're going to be like, ah. And then five minutes later, we'll be like, oh. And then for the next thousand years, we'll be like, ah, like everything's going to start making more sense. But right now, the Bible says we see in part, we know in part. And if you don't understand, are you going to keep trusting him? God still heals. God still delivers. God, God still forgives sin. So, of course, he's still going to heal today. Why didn't it happen? I don't know. And I want you to know if, if you were believing for someone and they passed away early. First of all, my heart goes out to you. I'm so sorry that happened. But number two, man, don't let that shake your faith. Don't let that shake what you believe. I'm, I know God's heart goes out to you. The Bible says when Lazarus died, Jesus came to raise him from the dead. His sisters, Mary and Martha, were crying. The Bible says Jesus started crying. But why? He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Because Mary and Martha, his heart was breaking for what broke their heart. So if you're in this place and you feel, feel heartbroken because of something, man, God's heart is close to yours. But don't let anything shake your faith. Don't let what you see change what you believe. Let what you believe change what you see. But man, God will not only forgive your, your iniquities, forgive your sin, but he's going he's gonna to heal every single disease. Don't let anything shake that. It goes on to say, um, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Man, that sounds, that sounds like good news. That if you trust in God, man, these are the benefits you get. And you only get them if you put your faith in, in, in God saying, hey, God, I trust you. I don't care what I see. I don't care what I feel. The Bible says I walk by faith and not by sight. Basically, another way you could say that is I walk by faith and not by my five senses. Man, are you walking by faith or are you walking by what you see? Because I guarantee you, if you walk by faith, it's going to change what you see. Number two, man, if you know heaven is our home, we need to live eternally minded. Eternity minded. Uh, Colossians 1, uh, or Colossians 3, uh, starting in verse 1, it says, If then we were raised with Christ, seek those things which are from above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not things on this earth. It says, hey, set your thoughts on the things that are above, not on this earth. I mean, thoughts are crazy. Anyone ever get, like, crazy thoughts? Anyone ever get, like, stinking thinking? Like, just, like, thought after thought after thought comes, and you're like, ah, like, what's wrong with me? You know you're not responsible for what thoughts come, but you're responsible with what you do with them. Are you going to own them? Are you going to keep thinking about them? They say, um, experts say that our mind thinks between 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts in a single day. And that's an average of 2,500 thoughts every hour. I mean, that's a lot of thoughts. You're not responsible for what thoughts come, but you're responsible for what you do with them. I heard someone say it like this, that every mind needs a bouncer at the door that can say, hey, what, is this thought coming in? No, no, not that one. Can this thought come in? Yeah. Man, you're, you need to line your thoughts up with what God's word says. And science will say there's this thing called the law of replacement, which means if you get a thought, you can actually replace that thought with another thought. Do you know you can only think on one thing at one time? And you might be out there saying, no, like, I think I'm like, 
My mind's always thinking on multiple things. Like, I'm great at multitasking. Multitasking actually is a myth. What multitasking is, is you're going, you're thinking on one thing and you're quickly switching your brain to another thing and you're quickly switching back and forth. Your brain can't think two thoughts at one time. What's the good news there? You can replace a thought and if you're replacing it with the right thing in that moment, you can't be thinking on the wrong thing when you're thinking on the right thing. If you replace those wrong thoughts with God's word, there's only so much space up there. But what do we do? A thought comes, we start thinking on it, thinking on it, thinking on it. But what if you replace that with what God's word says? You might replace it, and then two seconds later, that's not, that was cool, that sounded like the iPhone thing. <laughs> like that, that wrong thought comes. And then what do you do? You replace it again. And then five minutes later, and then you replace it again. And then all of a sudden the wrong thought comes again. I had to make sure I wasn't getting a text. Uh, you replace it again. You just keep replacing it and replacing it and replacing it. You might have to do it a million times in a day, but you know what? If you start changing the way you think, the Bible says you need to transform the way you think. Once you start doing that, it's going to get easier and easier and easier. They even say, science even says, the more you are tempted to get angry and you choose not to get angry, it actually rewires your brain to not get angry as much. Isn't that insane? So the more you choose to walk in love, the easier it's going to get. The more you choose to resist those thoughts, the easier it's going to get. But we need to be eternity-minded. What does that mean? We need to be eternity-minded. That means we need to be thinking on the things that are going to matter for eternity. Because so many times we're, we're worried about, and our insecurities are, are about, like, what does this person think? Or what does that person think? Or what, how am I doing in school? And all of a sudden we're thinking on the wrong things. We're putting our security in the wrong things. Because I like to think back, like 10 years ago, the things that bothered Devin 10 years, 10 years ago. I think back now and I'm like, that wasn't a big deal. Like think back to the things that bothered you when you were like 10 years old. Does any, is any of that stuff still relevant? Like I look at little 10 year old Devin and I'm like, man, you had it good. <laughs> you know, you got nothing to worry about. But what happens? All these things come against you. But the things that bothered you when you were 10 years old isn't a big deal. Man, things that bothered you when you were in high school. Because you know in high school you're like, oh man, what's everyone going to think about me? Ah, like, like ah, what, what do my peers think? What is, like, and then five years later you're like, I don't know anyone from high school. This is awesome. <laughs> like what you worried so much about has no relevance. It, it, it doesn't even matter anymore. But I like to think about this too. Because the Bible says if we believe on Jesus, we have eternity promised for us. Do you know we're still going to exist a thousand years from now? Like, we're not going to be here on this earth, but man, we're still going to exist. The Bible says we'll be up in heaven, we'll have different jobs. I don't know what that looks like, but we're still going to be around. I believe that those relationships we have that are God connections, we're still going to have them up there. That we might all still be hanging out together, like the you might still be like getting together. I don't know what that looks like, but I believe that God connections last forever. a thousand years from now, what's your life going to look like? Like that kind of blows your mind when you think about it, that we're still literally going to exist a thousand years from now. Again, not on this earth, up in heaven. In a thousand years from now, the things that bothered you today, are they still going to bother you? Or are you going to be like, yeah, that was no big deal. I should have just trusted God with that. What was I thinking? What was little 10 year old Devin thinking? I mean, that's the perspective we're going to have. But on the flip side of that, what is going to matter a thousand years from now? Because the Bible says that the only thing we can bring to heaven is people. Or are we going to be saying, man, I wish that, man, I wish I would have like, I wish I would have done a little bit better in school. And that's great. Like, it's great to do good in school. Or are we going to say, man, I wish I would have told so-and-so about God's love for them. I wish I would have invited so-and-so to church. Man, I wish I would have lived bolder. I wish I would have lived more on fire for God. What are we going to say a thousand years from now? Two thousand, three thousand, because we're still going to exist. And you might be out there saying, like, that's crazy. Man, we're going to, man, if you believe in Jesus, we have forever promise to us. Again, I don't exactly know what that looks like. But man, we have forever promise to us up in heaven that we're going to be with Jesus forever. Or what's going to matter to us back then? 
It's not the things that weigh on us day after day, but it's going to be the people that we reached or we should have reached. Moving on, point number three, and we're going to start to close here. But man, if we know that heaven is our home, we're going to live knowing that people are our purpose. People are our purpose. Matthew 9, 36 says, speaking about Jesus, it says, as he saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them because they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Everyone say pity. What's pity? What does that mean? Well, the Bible definition of that there in the Greek, it actually says that Jesus was moved to his bowels. That's fun, right? <laughs> like, what does that even mean? When I first heard that, I'm like, that's weird. But here's what it means. Do you ever see something and it just like tears you up on the inside? It just makes you feel so sick on the inside. You're not physically sick, but you just feel sick on the inside. For me, it's every time I'm flipping through channels late at night and I see like that commercial with those animals and they're in the cages and I'm just like, ah, I'm like crying on my couch, like wishing I'd never start flipping the channel. Anyone have been there? Like I hate those commercials. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to give everything. I'm going to sell my house after seeing that. But you know, you ever see something that just tears you up so much on the inside and you say, man, man, that's not right. It says Jesus saw... Jesus saw these people, and he saw that they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know when Jesus sees, sees people and sees them worried, helpless, going through life, struggling, struggling with depression, insecurity, anxiety, you know Jesus' heart goes out to them? When Jesus sees people lost, people broken, all, all, you can see it all through scriptures. Man, Jesus' heart went out to them. And right here, it specifically says, man, he had pity. And what that means is he was torn up so much on the inside. He had so much compassion for them, as other translations say, that he just like felt sick on the inside. And he thought, man, something needs done about this. Uh, going on to verse 37, it says, he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send out more workers into his fields. And what, he, what Jesus is saying there is, hey, the harvest is plentiful. People are ready. Like Jesus is seeing person after person that's, that's worried, that's helpless, that, that needs God in their life. And, and what's, what are people doing? Nothing. And Jesus is like, there, something needs done about this. So he starts praying, God, send out laborers. Send out laborers. Send out laborers. Do you know the three most important things to Jesus? Do you know what they are? If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, people. Number two, people. Number three, people. spoiler alert, people. <laughs> Man, the three most important things to Jesus are people, people, people. He saw people. He saw them helpless, broken, hurting, and it tore them up on the inside. And do you know what Jesus did? Do you know where Jesus did most of the miracles? It wasn't in the four walls of a church or the temple or synagogue. Or He did them in the street. He did them where the people were. And here's the problem with, with a lot of us church people. We, we, you know, we start coming to church. We love Jesus. God changed our life around. But at some point, we become more consumed with finding a seat than what God's calling us to do out in the street. We get so consumed with, oh, it's Wednesday night. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear a good word, brother. I'm going to sit here all proper. I'm going to... Read my Bible, and I'm going to go out and do nothing with it. I heard someone say it like this. The biggest problem with, with the church of today is we've become consumers of the product instead of distributors. But man, what if we lived our life on mission? What if we said, hey, God, I want you to use me in a mighty way. Everywhere I go, I, wanna, I want you to bring people in my path. Because that's a crazy prayer. When you say, God, use me, that's a, that's a crazy prayer. Because you know what? He's going to do it. There's one time I was walking through the mall, and I just, you know, just want to mind my own business. And... I looked up. There's someone who I mean, hadn't been in church for years. I didn't want to talk to them. I just wanted to go do my thing. But in that moment, God just arrested my heart because I prayed that prayer. And you might pray that prayer, and God might inconvenience you. You might be on your way to class, and, and God puts someone in your path. But again, a thousand years from now, what's going to be more important? The fact you reached out to that person? Or the fact you made it to class on time with five minutes to spare. Like, what's going to matter? But what if we were willing to be inconvenienced for people? If God's changed your life, it's for two reasons. Number one, he loves you so much. God's love for you 
is so, so great. The Bible says, Paul's praying, he says, I pray you know the height, the depth, the width, the breadth of the love of Christ. Though it's so great, you're never going to fully comprehend it. Do you know your brain can't wrap itself around God's love? It's that great. It's that great. God loves you so much, you, it just boggles your mind. You can't even like wrap your brain around it. God's love for you is so amazing. But what if we realize that same love for us is the same love he's got for so-and-so, who we see at school, who parties it up every weekend, who's living like the devil himself. Man, what if we realize God loved that person just as much as he loved, loved me, just as much as he loved you? And what if we lived life on mission? And if God's changed your life, if you've experienced God's love, I believe the, the level of your experience needs to dictate the level of your expression. If you've experienced God's love in a mighty way, man, that should change the way you express God's love to everyone around you. If God changed your life, the Bible says, freely as you receive, freely give. Are you going to give it out to everyone around you? You're going to hold it in. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy. It doesn't have to be like you stand on your lunchroom table and you're like, Jesus loves you. Like I know someone, this was years ago, who um, would, I didn't know this person, but I knew of them. They would stand in the street corner shouting at cars going by, shouting, Jesus loves you. And they'd throw Bibles at cars occasionally. Like that's weird. No one, no one likes that. I think that's weird. And I go to church, I work at a church and I think that's weird. But what does it look like? Everyone around you, everyone in your sphere of influence, you love them unconditionally. If they treat you bad, you treat them with love. Just because they treat you like the devil doesn't mean you have to stop treating them like Jesus. And you love unconditionally, and you're bold with your faith. And it's as simple as this. It's just as simple as saying, hey, hey, Jamie, what are you doing Wednesday night? You want to come with me to church? That's so easy, right? But we, like, we get all crazy in our heads, and we think, oh, man, oh, Jamie's going to, if I invite him to church, he's going to, He's going he's gonna to think I'm weird. He's going to, oh man, I, I can't say that. I can't say that. No, don't psych yourself out, but just be normal. It's normal to invite someone to church. In fact, say, hey, why don't you come to church with me? I'll, I'll, I'll buy you a pumpkin spice cold brew on the way. Like no one can say no to that. That's the best way to get someone saved. But what are you going to do? Are you going to sit in your seat? Are you going to come to church week after week? Or are you going to impact the world around you? Jesus saw the people and his heart was broken because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In closing, I heard this story a while back and it just, I thought it was the craziest thing. So a number of years ago, there was this, um, this couple, they were madly in love. They got married. Everything was perfect. Well, the husband went to the doctors one day, got a diagnosis that he had cancer. So as time went on, they fought it. They, they went through other treatment, and he ended up passing away. And the wife, of course, she's heartbroken. A year goes by. Valentine's Day, she gets a knock at the door. It, it's a man delivering flowers. And the flowers have a note on it. And it says this. It says, from your loving husband, love you, miss you, I'll see you soon. And she starts freaking out because, again, her husband passed away a whole year earlier. So she calls her friends, and, and she's saying things like, hey, I know this is you. Like, is this a joke? This is not funny. What is it? Everyone keeps saying, it wasn't me. So in desperation, she calls the flower shop. Nothing. They have no idea. She goes down to the flower shop, asks to speak to the manager. Manager comes out. She has a picture of her husband. She shows the manager a picture of her husband, and she says, hey, I got these flowers delivered to my house with a note saying it was from my husband, but he passed away a year ago. There's no way it's from him. I don't know if this is a joke. If this is not funny. Who is this? The manager of the flower shop looks at her and says, ma'am, what? those are from your husband. Again, she says, there's no way. There's no way he passed away. I saw him pass away a year ago. There's no way it was from him. The owner of the flower shop looks at her and says, No. Those are from your husband. Because before he passed away, he came in here and paid enough money for you to get flowers delivered to you for the rest of your life on Valentine's Day. So you'll never forget how much he loves you. And when I heard that, you know, my eyes are like welling up because I'm kind of an emotional guy sometimes. And, and it just broke my heart. 
But when I heard that, I thought, that's such an amazing example of God's love. That God sent his only son to die on the cross. He sent his only son to die a brutal death that we should have received. He paid the price so we'd never forget how much he loves us. He paid this horrible price for just the chance that we'd love him back. I mean, God loves you so much. And if you're out there saying, I've never heard this before. I've never heard that this God loves me. That he's willing to pay that price. I want you to know God is madly in love with you. He's not obsessed. He's not thinking about your past, but he's obsessed with your future. God doesn't care where you've been. He just wants you to come to him now. So I'm gonna give two opportunities. We're gonna close up here. Number one, we're gonna pray a prayer. And if you say, God, I want you to use me. I want you, I want you to use me to change my school. I want you to use me to change my workplace. I want you to mean this. And we're going to make a commitment that we're going to step out, that God's, God is going to bring us opportunities, and we're going to be faithful. So when we step into eternity, we're not going to be regretting, man, I should have talked to so-and-so. I should have talked to so-and-so. Or we're going to step out into every opportunity God gives us. And it's a dangerous prayer, so don't say it unless you mean it. But when you pray that, I believe that even tomorrow, God's going to bring pe people in your path that need hope, that need life, and you're going to be the person that God uses to change everything. Isn't it amazing? And after we pray that prayer, if you're in this place and you say, hey, this Jesus you talked about today, this Jesus that loves you, that died for you, that paid this great price that you couldn't pay, if you want to receive him into your life, we're going to give you an opportunity. The Bible says you can know you have eternal life. And that's by believing on Jesus, believing he died on the cross, rose from the dead, and confessing him as your Lord. Basically, that means giving him your life. That's how you know you have eternal life. And God loves you so much. God's not concerned with your past, but he's obsessed with your future. And the second we call on him, we know, hey, we have eternity promised for us up in heaven. And I believe if we live with that kind of mindset, knowing, hey, we're citizens of heaven. We're eternity-minded. You know, we're going to step out. We're going to know that people are our purpose. We're going to get up to heaven, and God's going to say these words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because in those moments, when God says that to you, what's not going to matter is so-and-so who, in third grade, you know, thought you were cool. Or so-and-so in high school who thought you were like the coolest person ever. Or maybe your boss that, that they liked you. Or, or fill in the blank. What's going to matter? That the God who created the entire universe looks you in the eyes and says, hey, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray.